Hello, thank you. I'm Ron Navarro from Southern California. Welcome to our second IODA webinar called Mentorship to Support Diversity. We have a bevy of exciting speakers, Dr. Dematos, Dr. Fu, Dr. Tiart, and, and Mr. Monzel, but more on them later. I wanna thank my IODA webinar committee, Carolyn Hing, Carrie Coleus, and Julie Samora, who is my co-chair for this webinar today. I also want to thank the leadership of IODA for their dedication to diversity in orthopedic surgery worldwide, especially Dr. Jenny Green for her determination to initiate this group. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers, and I want to get right into it. Uh, first of all, Dr. Camilla Dematos is a uh, tumor surgeon at Skåne University Hospital in Lund, Sweden. She is a founder and president of AMOB, which is loosely translated as the Association of Female Orthopedists of Brazil, as well as being a founding member of WOW or WOW Ortho or Women in Orthopedics Worldwide. This group promotes and empowers and advances women in orthopedic surgery. Dr. D'Amato's uh, uh, talk is on mentorship to support the diversity, the Brazilian experience. Thank you and welcome Dr. D'Amato's. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Should I start or? Yes, sure. Yeah, you can start. Sorry. Okay. So I'm just going to share. Well, again, it's uh, it's an honor to be invited by IOTA to be part of this uh, wonderful panel. Uh, like Ron uh, presented me, I'm Camila Dematos. I'm an orthopedic oncologist surgeon. I am Brazilian, uh, but I live and work in Sweden uh, since 2018. And uh, this talk, I hope it uh, will uh, help to show my role in a mob and the power of the internet, the power of collective and importance of using uh, technology and social media to do good. Uh, but first a little bit um, on uh, a mob. Oh, oh, so, we use it, we usually say in Portuguese, a mob. Um, so it was founded last year uh, during the pandemic, um, everything digitally, uh, July, 2020. Currently we have 670 registered women. Uh, so just to, for you guys to, to understand, Brazil is a continental size country. We have 211 million people and 26 states and a central district. So it's very, very uh, large. Um, so you, you guys know a little bit of our, our orthopedic history. We have our National Association, it's bought, it's called. Uh, it was founded in 1935. Our most updated number of active female surgeons in our national society is about five, uh, five and a half percent as of uh, 2021. Our first female was discovered and honored by our association. And she, she actually, she's Brazilian, but she graduated in Italy in 1971. So we form a mob is a group uh, um, that involves uh, orthopedic surgeons, uh, medical students, residents, and uh, women that are interested in orthopedics. Um, we have a board uh, with uh, nine different uh, women and uh, committees. So we're independent from our national society as of today. Um, and uh, a little bit about who we are. So this is the percentage of um, uh, women that are part of a mob. So you see the greens, uh, the, the, the blue here is medical students. It's uh, very important for us to, to register medical students and residents, uh, the, the red one here, as part of the, uh, uh, our association because they're active part of our association and uh, we believe that they are our future. Um, they help us not only um, with the being registered with our numbers, but they also um, play a collective, um, they, uh, they, they help with our collective structure that runs a mob at this point. Uh, since uh, as, as of now, we have no paid memberships. Uh, everything is done with the collective effort of the members on, and the board. So, and uh, so 
to talk a little bit about diversity, uh, this Amob is the first uh, orthopedic association in Brazil to ask about race and ethnicity. Uh, this is in Portuguese here. Um, unfortunately, we started to ask a little bit later. So we, uh, as of now, we only have 212 answers. Um, the blue one is uh, white. Uh, we have about 5% uh, uh, black women and about 19% PADA. PADA is, um, is uh, uh, a term that is uh, official still in Brazil. It's a mix of uh, black people and, and white people. Um, there's a lot of discussion in race in Brazil currently. A lot of people that are um, considered part of, they feel like they are black and there's still a lot of discussion with uh, this term. And uh, just so you guys know, Brazil still have a lot of uh, uh, racism and, uh, and it was the last uh, country in Western world to abolish uh, slavery. And um, so, it's uh, racism is still a big, big issue. So this data, although it seems like good because the like almost 20% of uh, black women and, and PADA is good, I think it's a little bit biased because the ones that answer in retrospect maybe are more engaged in the, in the race and ethnicity question. So, um, so how do we work? So everything in the mob started digitally. Uh, we promote, we try really hard to, to promote um, our association via uh, social media. And our most important communication tool is, um, as, as of now, Instagram and also our messaging groups. Uh, in our in our social media, we talk about uh, race and ethnicity and approach openly uh, subjects such as structural risk, racism, uh, black people in medicine, discussing openly how orthopedics can be more inclusive. And we also have a pioneer project, which is uh, a project to show the pioneers in, in the whole country in each state, because Brazil is very fixed in, uh, in uh, just like in the US, you have like New York, York and LA, Brazil has Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. So we try to uh, lift up and honor the, the first uh, orthopedic females in all the other states. Uh, so this is our mm. pioneer um, mm. project right now. Mm. And uh, okay, so to talk about a little bit, our messaging groups is very important because with our messaging group, we have different uh, types of groups and uh, uh, we have different committees and different types of groups to each committee. Um, so in, our, in those groups, uh, women feel a little bit more comfortable to discuss, to share and report and question. It's easy to find uh, uh, similar stories and mutual support. Um, some people have Facebook, we, we uh, the, the, the women in Brazil choose uh, messaging groups. It works really well for us. At this point, uh, we have uh, a few, we have a uh, different platforms like Telegram and WhatsApp. In Telegram, we have group uh, with uh, around 405 women, and our biggest group in um, WhatsApp is 257, which is the <laughs> the most you can have. Um, so. In, in those groups, so the, the medical students, they have their own group, but they are stimulated to be part of the collective work of a mob. So if they want to engage a little bit more, they can be part of uh, different um, committees like the regional committee, the scientific committee, and the media committee. A lot of uh, what we do is with the help of our medical students. And then to talk a little bit more about um, the specific programs within mentorships, uh, we have the uh, our program, which is to facilitate internships in places that have the female orthopedic surgeons. So this um, we we try to find women within our our association that are uh, able to to receive um, medical students, female medical students that are interested in orthopedics to spend some time like a month uh, or a little bit more like an internship um, and uh, and to try to show how it is to be not only to learn about orthopedics, but also to show um, what is the reality for uh, uh, a woman within orthopedics? Uh, we use like a match system. We have a Google Forms for the, the medical students that are interested in the programs. And we have a, a 
um, a Google form for the associate uh, the women that are associated with us to to receive those women, and we try to match um, geographically and uh, time uh, time based what is best for them. We they, we had we suffer a little bit of problems because of the pandemic. So they have um, a few of the women had difficulties to to receive and to travel. But the ones that we got, we receive a very positive feedback from, from both these students and the mentors. Uh, we have about 60 women that are going through this uh, process right now. The other program that we have is a program that is directed to orthopedic surgeons uh, that want to be board certified. So in Brazil, you don't need to be board certified to work. Uh, but we simulate all of them to be board certified. We think it's extremely important. And we found out with our messaging groups that uh, a lot of the women, they didn't get board certification because um, a lot of the reasons that are related on being female in orthopedics, like they were pregnant near the boards. It's, you can take your boards just uh, one date in Brazil as in the beginning of the year. So some of them were pregnant. They were afraid to do the test uh, and because uh, it's a two day test uh, uh, while they were pregnant. They didn't have time to study. Um, and then time passes on, life happens, and then they feel um, they don't feel the stimulus and they feel and it's coupled with shame and uh, and um, uh, a lot of shame that they don't have this and uh, it's hard for them to take the step to start studying again and by themselves. So we gather our associated women that want to help with uh, study plans with a Google Classroom and I give uh, give uh, um, lessons and and uh, and um, help them to study, but also a closed message group that there's no judgment. They are free to to speak uh, why or to have questions that are technical or within like topics or also to to. Um, talk about why they didn't do their boards, and uh, they're, it's been very, very positive. We we got a few women, uh, around 15 right now, that um, are in the group, and a lot of associated women that are helping with that. Around 15% of the women with us, they are not board certified. Uh, the women, uh, the orthopedic surgeons within a mob that are registered. So it's a lot and we want to help them. And uh, it's been very positive. This is a, a very new program, uh, but already having a lot of impact. And just to summarize, we also have other projects that are not specifically into mentorships, uh, but we share, we, we're going to share international experience and stimulate women to find different paths. Uh, sometimes they they are afraid to take uh, um, to the international fellowships or do something that is different just because they did never met someone that did that. We have inspirational women and we try to show diversity in different fields. We are openly, openly um, uh, to to every type types of uh, genders and uh, and uh, sexual orientations. And this is like not this type of support is not seen. Uh, openly, of course, uh, most of the, the the societies they they support that, but not openly as we do in our social media. And we have co close contact with the other medical students, not just female orthopedic surgeons, because in Brazil they have leagues, orthopedics leagues that, that of the medical students that are interested in ortho. So we try to help them with uh, lectures and um, and projects as well. So. Um, I am. Uh, I just want to. Uh, we're not done yet. It's a lot of work to do uh, throughout mentorship and also trying to understand how women get into orthopedics in different countries. The culture changes, but we have uh, similar problems and local problems that need to be discussed and and to find solutions both locally and globally. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, this is my email if you have uh, any questions. Dr. Domatos, thank you so much for the wonderful lecture. Kudos to you to encourage board certification. One quick question. How is the culture changing from uh, AMOB's work uh, amongst male surgeons uh, in the country? Well, we have very positive uh, um, feedback from uh, a lot of leaders within uh, 
uh, subspecialty societies and support from them that we, so we try to do everything independently and we did not push anybody to support us. And this support came naturally. And this is a very, very satisfying and uh, gratifying um, feeling because it shows that our little ant work and, uh, and a lot of patient, it pays out and positive, a positive reinforcement, it pays Thank out. You. Thank you. We're so proud of you and supportive of your work. Uh, uh, please uh, stay on for some questions later. Uh, I think we're going to move on now, but wonderful talk. Thank you again. Thank you. It's my good pleasure now to uh, introduce Dr. Freddie Fu. Dr. Fu is the chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Pittsburgh in the USA. Dr. Fu oversees and acted as a catalyst for one of the most one of the top most ethically and gender diversified orthopedic training programs in America. I have personal experience with Dr. Fu's advocacy as uh, he he took me as a uh, fellow. I was one of the first uh, uh, Latin American fellows in his uh, under his guidance and tutelage. Uh, he has uh, so many accolades, it would take hours to go over them. He's uh, one of the top most published authors in the realm of ACL surgery. But uh, here today, he's uh, um, here to speak with us about effective strategies to create diversity in a non-diverse healthcare organization. Dr. Fu, thank you so much for coming and the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ron. And thanks uh, for organizing this. And again, uh, thank Julie. Julie has already affected many people, including my residents, Maria. Uh, Maria started the Perry Initiative in Pittsburgh because of Julie. So thank you so much, Julie. You have done so much already in women of competing. Of course, Chrissy Weber, thank her very, very much too. In fact, she was a resident in Iowa and picked me up in the airport. Uh, when I was a visiting professor there in the early 90s. So that, that how time flies in about 20 years. She was the you know, boss of AOS. Now, I think uh, anything in life to create harmony is, is a time, place, and people. And this is a ch ancient Chinese uh, wisdom. So diversity, gender equity is the same. The time, place, and people. So you have to look at every country, every environment and see how it works. Now, but the principle is the same in medicine. My professor Ferguson, a mentor, tell us just to do the right thing and take good care of your patients. And definitely if you have uh, more people with more diverse background uh, to take care of people, the patient will be taken care of better and we will learn from each other too. So I think it's important to respect the past so we can embrace the future. So it's not good to criticize, oh my God, those are all tall, uh, you know, white people, uh, men taking care of orthopedic and don't include anybody. This is not the point. The point is uh, why, why was it like this and how can we improve on the future? Now, this is a picture in the early 70s uh, of my department. Ferguson is in the front and there are many famous people in this picture that become chairman like George Bentley in England and Bob Greer and Mencken and just left. And you can see in circle is, uh, is the trophy female residence or not. Okay, she is Mary Clark. So she was the only two female residents in the 70s and become the first female faculty in Pittsburgh. There's one Turkish you know, residence sitting right, standing right next to Mary Clark, and he become chair in Turk Ankara a little later. Uh, one Afro-American residence and one Asian as me. Okay, but it, it's not the point. The point is Dr. Ferguson want to make sure that we are not being a trophy person. We're there because we want to be the best we can. And you can, you can see Dr. Ferguson took care of Mary Clark really well. When she finished the residency, she was sent to rentals in California, work with him with Jack and Perry. Now, interestingly, two of our um, uh, graduate, Dr. Vert Mooney, who became chairman at UC Southwestern later, and Shannon Stelfer, who became chairman 
at uh, University of Southern Illinois later uh, were uh, working with Perry also at the same time. So Dr. Ferguson already understand working with Dr. Perry, a woman at the time, is critical to understand many problems, especially in polio and other problems. And Mary Clark came back, became a faculty, and in fact, she taught me um, you know, a lot of things about pediatrics and become a professor uh, at um, you know, Hershey under Bob Graham, the other you know, um, you know, chair that was trained Ferguson. By the way, chair um, trained by Ferguson, uh, numbers about 65. I bet he trained the most chair uh, in the world. Now, why, why do we have to transform to have uh, more different uh, genders, uh, different diversity, different ethnic group? Um, I think it's definitely better for the patient care. And also to cultivate future leaders. For example, you can just have, look at as Christy Weber, and you can see Julie is now the president of um, the, you know, uh, the Jackie Perry Society. So those are really big leaders uh, to really carry the torch for this mission. Again, we have to include everybody. Sometimes it's hard to do. I still remember in the 70s, even in the 90s, uh, some of the uh, faculty, old time faculty say, wow, uh, can a woman really work? Uh, she gonna take time off from her pregnancy and uh, why well, we cannot count on them to work? And this is totally a very, very bad concept. And I think that in uh, my department, this has all been corrected and nobody even talk about it because they know men and women are equal and we have to help each other to raise our children. So, uh, but all of them have the right to work as an orthopedic surgeon too. And of course, other ethics group too has to be involved. Now, I don't want to use the first diversity as much. Why? Because in America, diversity is only black and white. <laughs> and I'm not even black or white. So uh, I would say that this is a diversity of perspective. You have to understand the perspective of the other side, whoever they are, okay? So in other words, you need very good communication skill you can hopefully can read other people's mind so that you can really understand in depth um, other people's feelings and how they can be promoted to the level they need to be. Now, to create equal playing field for everybody is not simple. It takes many years, even if you have the, you know, the will to do it. For example, if Dr. Ferguson want to have many women residents, he cannot even really do it because there's no nobody applying for the residents at the time as a woman or black people or Asian in America. But essentially, if you create an equal playing field, then after a while, there'll be a critical mass and this critical mass will, will be non-stoppable. It'll create its own, you know, uh, momentum to create like for in female, in black and Latino, all those things will be created. So they will, you know, have the equal say and equal opportunity uh, for the field of orthopedic surgery. Now, this is something that is very really hard to do. It looks simple. And this is something that Dr. Ferguson, I must say, do really well, including allowing me to reach my maximum potential. So he said, basically, Everybody have a different motor. Nobody is created the same. The key is to allow everyone to reach the maximum potential. So he accepted me as a resident and a faculty. And somebody who could come from Hong Kong and don't speak English that well and uh, become successful in sport medicine. And eventually I took over uh, from him after Dr. Herndon was a chairman in between. So this is what I would say that somebody can foresee that potential and also the mentorship is there to protect and allow this growth throughout the years. Now, this is interesting picture we find is on my wall right now. This is in 1996. This is my sport medicine division 
in Pittsburgh. You can see myself, JP Warner, Chris Hanna was my key faculty, and there are many important people uh, on the picture. Moises Cohen from uh, Brazil, Chi Wachin from Taiwan, Christian Fink from Austria, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, many good people. I mean, I would say J. Eric Gang, uh, Rene Abdullah, and uh, so many of them become leaders in the field. But two of these very important people are the youngest one. One is Ron Navarro, you can see, and Gary B, my fellow American fellow, my first, you know, Latino, you know, fellow, and my first female fellow. So what happened is we put these two young people in the path of people with great minds. And when they talk to these people, they understand their opportunity and they will be confident. They will know how to go higher to reach the maximum potential. So this is a really historical picture right here. Now, what happened to Gary Beam, my first fellow, female fellow in 1996? So she is an extremely smart woman, come from Columbia Medical School and Residency. And actually what I did is something unusual because at that time the American football team is all taken care by male fellow because nobody dared to send a female fellow to the locker room uh, of this American football. And also at that time, the coach is extremely famous. Johnny Majors who won the national championship for Pitt in 1976. Uh, Southern gentleman, old fashioned, so I did not ask anybody. I put Gary Beam to be in charge of the football team and sent her right into the male's locker room. Oh my God, and uh, it can be up wrong, it can be fired, but it didn't happen. What happened is uh, they love her. <laughs> Dr. Coach Major loved Gary Beam and embraced her. And as a result, Gary became very successful, very confident in what she is doing. And in fact, later in life, AOS now just say also big children place her own trail to Olympics. She's been the chief and make the office, office in the World Olympics in Russia and also with the Paralympics uh, in 16 and 18. So she practiced in Colorado and she is a mentor to many people, uh, also a role model to, to many too. So we're really proud of uh, Gloria. Now we have other women that come through the program that become successful and I only pick a few to show you. Uh, and they are all from different background. Robin West uh, was uh, an Olympic level swimmer uh, and was my fellow and faculty for 15 years now. She'd run the whole Innova um, host, uh, hospital program in DC and a head team doctor for two professional team. She's the only female <laughs> that is a head of the two professional team in baseball and in American football. Vonda right now practice in Atlanta is a aging expert. Kelly Middleton, uh, who played professional softball, now turned into a sport medicine expert after the fellowship in the HSS. And Tonil Chan, a uh, very prolific, you know, resident, ran many paper. Uh, at a young age, become the president of uh, Musculoskeletal Infection Society. And now she is at Harvard with Jim Kang, uh, my former faculty too, and very successful in research. Uh, Alexis Coleman, my fellow uh, in Mount Sinai, now is the US Open tennis uh, you know, doctor and also the doctor for the women's tennis team. And Connie Chu worked for us for 15 years and now is the head of research in Stanford. She probably have more, more grant than anybody else in America. So you understand this, all these ladies, and uh, there are more to show you, but I'm just telling you, when they leave Pittsburgh, they, they even do bigger and better things. And this is what we want to see. Now, there are not other genders. And, the, and, and Dr. Kang, for example, who is Korean, uh, become chairman at Brigham at Harvard. And Rocky Tron, uh, my head of research, uh, now become head of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, so those are all leaders we're talking about. And of course, in the, you know, Afro-American, we have Mac Hogan, who's a foot anchor specialist. Uh, he is a program director who can get a very good example, uh, you know, to attract people of different direction. And you can see uh, right in the middle is uh, Maria, uh, who was uh, trained by Julia. 
Uh, and Maria is now our second year residence in the laboratory. And she speaks so highly of Julia as a mentor. And she started the Perry Initiative, which is a program to educate high school women to be interested in orthopedic children. Now, we, we uh, have a little bit problem attracting more Afro-American to Pittsburgh. And we're doing a pretty good job right now. We are now have four faculty um, in this uh, category. Beck Hogan, uh, Dr. McCoy, um, who is a pediatric, Dr. King, and Fred Enko, and Dr. Taylor in trauma. So uh, again, it's a critical mass. And like I say, it cannot be a trophy, you know, black people. It has to be a critical mass that people feel comfortable working there and feel like that they're part of the whole team. <coughs> now, we have a few programs in America that also accept foreign medical graduates. So most programs in America, I would say 95% will only accept American trained, you know, graduates from medical school. And I think being coming from Hong Kong, that I went to medical school in America, I think it's good to look at other possibilities. So we have people from Austria, Varina, we have uh, Carola from Netherlands, uh, Christian Leatherman now at Harvard, and uh, Volker Mussel now very successful, um, Sport Medicine in Prisbrook, and Wei Chang, who is now uh, in New York and Long Island from China. So again, when people are in residence in Prisbrook, it's like a new United Nations, uh, so you can really talk to anybody from different countries uh, and different ethnic background and different genders. And er so it's, it's normal. It's like a normal culture. This is like a New York City or something like that. And also the other you know, interesting thing is Pittsburgh is a very nice place for international visitors, safe, and the university have many research opportunities. So I have trained more than 1,500 fellow in the last 35 years from 62 countries. And when they came, they become interacting with the residents and faculty. For example, Brian Clough at, uh, Brian Clough at Rush is a very good friend with Lucille Ellen in Brazil. Uh, Jonathan Ticker in New York City is a good friend with Paul Chen in Singapore. And, you know, Andre Emhoff in Munich, Germany. So they're lifelong friends. So you understand. So when you come to Pittsburgh, it's not just, well, I'm going to come to Pittsburgh to work, but you actually, it's a whole fraternity of people with different background to, to help you to think differently about people. So we have to create this well-being environment for everybody, diversity, inclusion, and equity. So if you really think about these three things, I think you're going to have a well-being department and well-being faculty and trainees. Now, what's the transformation? In 1999, I became the chairman of a forbidden industry of Pittsburgh. At the time, 5% uh, of our trainees are women, 10% faculty, uh, Afro-American 5% trainees, and zero faculty. Uh, in, in, in the year two, 2021, we have 30% uh, trainees and faculty of women almost, and 20% uh, trainees and 5% faculty of federal American. So if you look at the whole residency, about 45% uh, of our trainee residents are from different backgrounds. And of course, we have to work with the regular, you know, traditional people because you cannot ignore <laughs> everybody's successful. So like Ferguson trained 60 chairmen, I have trained about 50 chairmen in the last 20 years. And most of them are, you know, uh, Caucasian white, Man, okay, but also sometimes the other races uh, also become chair, but it's gonna take some time to catch up that way. So let's go back to the time, place, and the people, okay? So this is an important wisdom that we have to learn. So if you're in South Africa, in Brazil, in London, England, and Hong Kong, they may be very different than America. Uh, America, when I came in the 70s, I came in about 1970. I came because it was called a melting port of all culture. And we had to create the same for orthopedic, you know, in our department, of course, across the nation too. Now, this is a class that, in coming class that are coming in two weeks. So again, I would say the AOS now, when I received the diversity award, uh, about 10 years ago, the heading was, Gears of Pittsburgh creates a melting pot 
of orthopedic excellence. And uh, I would say that this melting pot is gender and color blind. And if you look at these classes, they are ethnic group, they are gender diversity. And uh, it's a very, and we actually pick the best people. That's about it. Not because we want to pick a woman, we want to pick an Asian, we want to pick an Afro-American. We just pick the best people for the program. If you pick them, hopefully pick, they will come. And so far, I must say that we're very successful. We picked the top group. And this year, we picked the top eight of the internship, which never happened before in the history of Pittsburgh. It's a matching program. Usually, we go to like 15 numbers to get eight people. But now, just we, we, we get the top people, including five from the West Coast. So this is the melting pot of my department. This is a mosaic created by uh, Dr. Urish. This is a 3,300 pictures of uh, people in my department in the last you know, six years when he became faculty, he saved it. And this is a logo who is the IP mail, which is a steel industry. So you can see this is how we build our department. Lastly, this is something that a little bit sentimental. Um, and uh, on the left, you see Dr. Ferguson. Uh, this is made by one of the former residents uh, from, um, you know, Arizona. Um, and um, but on, the, on that, I, 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 I paste a letter. Uh, he wrote me in 2005, just a few years before he passed away. And this is 20 years after he retired. Essentially, he still write me a handwriting and tell me what he thinks about our department and how am I doing. And this one is very special because for the first time, he wrote the word. He said, don't let the worst reflection on the human race slow you down. Walk through it, overcome it. So now, interestingly, I told you, he, he's a rainmaker, okay? I'm the flower and the seeds, okay? He poured in and let me grow. But on, on a hand, he gave me an unconditional and lifetime mentorship so I can grow to my maximum potential. And no matter who I am, whether I am Caucasian, black, woman, man, but he protect me in the, in the background. He know people talk maybe negative about me because of my ethnic background, but he had to work through it. And all of you had to work through it too. Female had to work through it, black, work through it, and Latino. So anyway, this mentorship is lifelong and I miss it because I don't think, uh, but the good thing is I still talk to my uh, trainees almost all the time, but now we do email and I don't think I can write as good as Ferguson. So lifelong learning, you can see this is alphabetic tree with the roots and branches coming up. You can see the people learning on the lawn and far away is the cathedral learning, which is the building for University of Pittsburgh. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Dr. Fu, thank you so much for that excellent talk. You have, um, you have demonstrated time and time again, your leadership and diversity, equity and inclusion. And my question for you is, how do you get the uninitiated to drink the Kool-Aid? Yeah, I, I think that you just, like I say, you have to have the mentality to, allow everybody to be successful and make the maximum potential. And being a Asian and uh, myself and the first residents in the whole program. So I know how it feels. So I'm not afraid to take a step like putting Gloria Beam into the male locker room, okay? It's a big stop. So I, I think that this is a, and of course you have to respect Dr. Ferguson who really, give me all the support uh, and every, I would say, weapon and it protect me through his lifetime to get me where I am. And just like you, Julie, I mean, you've been already doing a great thing at Ohio State. I know that, I heard so much about you. You, you take people to your house, uh, you have journal club, everything. So again, you know, they talk so much about you, you are a mentor leader now. So, so that's it, okay, you just have to set, um, you know, like a, a environment that everybody be successful. 
Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Fu, a wonderful talk. Uh, thank you, Julie, for the question. Uh, uh, amazing walk down memory lane, so inspiring. Uh, you're going to inspire so many more uh, due to this technology that will allow others to see this. And uh, uh, thank you once again for, for the wonderful time you gave us today. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you. We will uh, move on. Uh, I want to uh, now introduce, it's my good pleasure to uh, introduce Marie Tiart. Uh, Dr. Tiart is the pediatric orthopedic surgeon at Tigerberg Hospital, which is uh, associated with Stellenbosch University in Cape Town, South Africa. She's the uh, founder of so the South African Female Orthopedic Surgeon Society, and she's also active in women in orthopedics worldwide. Dr. Tiart is going to speak to us today on mentorship and gender diversity in South Africa. Uh, thank you for coming, Dr. Tiart. Uh, thank you very much for having me, Ron. Um, thanks to AuthorHub and to IOTA. Um, I'm really honored to be on this panel. Um, so I'm going to just give you just a little bit of a taste of mentorship and gender diversity in South Africa. So I had to put this picture in. Um, so this is Texas in Europe, um, overlapped on the left-hand side. Um, and I had to use Texas because uh, everything is bigger and better in Texas, right? Well, from a geographic point of view, South Africa is bigger than Texas. And you can see that we take up almost the whole of Europe, um, just for you to understand how big our country is. So I think we're actually quite a young country if we look at when our first medical schools opened. So it was in the 1920s, um, whereas the US and the UK had medical schools as early as the 1780s. Um, orthopedics was actually under general surgery and was only seen as a separate entity in the 1930s. And by 1942, we only had nine orthopedic surgeons for the whole country. In 1952, our South African Orthopedic Association was formed and it had 45 members. Uh, residency posts or training posts were only open in our country from the mid 1950s to 1974, depending on which um, university um, we're talking about. So my own university, Stellenbosch, only had orthopedic training posts from 1974. And our first female orthopedic surgeon qualified in 1984, as in countrywide. So if I look at when the training posts actually opened and our first female, it's, it's probably not as bad as I always sort of thought. Currently, we have 1,008 active orthopedic surgeons for a population of 58 and a half million. Um, of those, we've got 51 um, actively board certified orthopedic surgeons. So as the US would call it attendings, um, these are consultants. And that works out to be a 5%. Um, I think better now, we've got 30 female registrars out of 175, so that's 17%. So we're definitely improving in numbers, um, but we know we need to do better and we need to improve the experience of the trainees. And we know in the literature that mentorship does this. So I decided to start um, the Female Orthopedic Surgeon Society um, last year. So we're also just like um, our British, uh, our Brazilian co counterparts, we're still a very um, relatively new society. Um, I was, I think it's one of those things of just perfect timing um, because due to COVID, uh, due to having the right people in the right place, I was able to introduce the idea of the society at our orthopedic um, annual Congress and our um, Commonwealth uh, presidents are invited to attend. So um, Dr. Uh, Christy Weber as the American president um, was um, there. And I think it just, you know, from a timing point of view, just worked out beautifully to catapult us forward. Um, I currently have four executive committee members so we are three attendings and one trainee. Um, we are racially diverse as well as being in different parts of the country to allow for a bit of um, geographic diversity as well. So um, I introduced it at the Congress um, and then we started canvassing for members. So we did this via our um, orthopedic association, via word of mouth, via WhatsApp groups, et cetera. 
And then we started creating social media accounts. So we've got a private Facebook group, we've got an Instagram page as well as Twitter. Um, currently, we're nearly at 50 members um, for our society, which if you think about, we only have 51 active attendees in our whole country, we're probably not doing too badly. Our members consist of um, attendings, uh, trainees, as well as what we call a medical officer. So that is a um, pre-training number. I think with time, as we gain momentum, we will open it up to medical students because there's definitely... Um, there's definitely a need and a want for it, but we're not quite there yet. I kind of, for me, want to walk before I can run. And we've done two um, webinars with, uh, with an international panel. And I think a lot can be said negatively regarding COVID, but for me, it's just been, this is a really great positive spin on COVID where um, global sort of virtual meetings have become the norm and being able to um, network and liaise globally has become really really easy so it's just helped me really move forward and then we created um, a mentoring program as well so how we did it so as as the exco team we um, discussed essentially all our members uh, most of them of which we, we someone knew someone and we paired them essentially according to um, personality or what we think they would um, sort of learn from each other and um, because we want to improve our training program. We've essentially asked senior members to mentor someone junior. I, don't get me wrong. I don't think that somebody junior can't teach me something, but I think if we're trying to improve our training process and how to navigate it, it's going to come better from someone senior. So we've got uh, attendings uh, that mentor trainees or the medical officers, and then we've even got some trainees that are mentoring the medical officers. When everyone signed up to be members of SAFOS, they were given an option whether they wanted to uh, mentor. So this is a voluntary process. And when we started to come together regarding um, the mentoring program, we sent out emails to our mentors just to remind them, you volunteered, are you happy with this? Um, you know, because we want to start pairing people up. We sent out a few of those reminder emails. And once everyone was happy, um, we sent our mentors the contact details for the mentees. And then a few weeks later, the mentees were also given the contact details for our mentors. It was really interesting to sort of figure out, because we're such a small group, whether it would be better for the pairs to be in the same location or the same university, or whether we would want them to have a more objective opinion or um, point of view. Um, and our feeling was we wanted them to have the freedom to be able to communicate openly um, and freely. So we have paired people up now in different geographical locations. I think time will tell whether this is going to work or not. Um, so again, um, we emphasize that it's voluntary. Um, and then we created a very um, sort of simple agreement contract between the pair. Um, essentially, the mentee could um, come and identify what goals that they wanted to um, obtain, uh, as well as um, how much contact they'd be. Um, we know there are different personalities. There are people that would want to sort of chat weekly. There might be others that want a more sort of rigid, um, you know, sort of a six weekly contact because of um, being uh, availability and things. And we just wanted there to be clear communication between the pair, what was acceptable and what they both wanted out of it. And essentially, we're going to trial it for three months in this pair, because as we know, there will be people that maybe don't click or don't, you know, they, they're not uh, benefiting as much. But, and, and that is what we've told them from the beginning. And that just then allows us to, to match them better in the future. So it's very early days for us still. Um, we're probably about six weeks into our mentoring program, but I've sent out a Google Forms to the mentees for feedback, and I got about more than 50% uh, back, which I think is relatively good for a survey. Um, and the early feedback has been mostly positive. So um, has the mentor made contact? So this percentage always looks so big, but it's a few um, responses. So two of our um, mentees have not uh, had contact with their mentor yet. Um, and that is something that we will um, address with time. Um, have you found the experience great? So the red and the blue are positive. 
Um, the yellow and the green is sort of a ho-hum versus not great. The not great um, obviously came from the mentee that hasn't had contact with her mentor. And then we asked them for any sort of comments. So these are some of the quotes that the, that the ladies wrote. Um, I think it's important uh, to see that um, they've been give, given encouragement and advice and that they feel comfortable to ask questions that they would ordinarily feel reluctant to ask. I mean, that's all we really want is that there's somebody, a safe person, a safe space where you can go and ask questions that you feel that you maybe can't ask in your own department. It feels like a genuine and personal outreach. Uh, people are very excited to see where it goes and there seems to be great support. Um, of course, not everything is rosy. So um, one of our mentees has been feeling a bit overwhelmed at work and is struggling to accommodate their mentor. Um, for me, I think as long as this mentee knows that there is somebody, um, you know, contactable, um, it's okay for, for people not to be able to make contact. Um, of course, this middle comment was from the person who hadn't um, met their mentor yet. It's difficult to make contact with someone you do not know or have not met. Or, and of course, because it's still early days, it's still too soon to comment. Um, South African culture is, is a little bit strange in the sense of um, there's probably a lot more hierarchy than we really sort of anticipated perhaps, because our mentees have all been given the mentor contact details. So, and been told that they can freely contact the mentor. So it just sort of shows you that there's, there's still this reluctance for someone junior to contact someone out of the blue senior. And I think that's something we'll have to look at and address um, going forward. We asked them also how we can improve our experience. So a lot of them said we should have a virtual meet and greet, like a Zoom meeting where everyone introduces themselves. And I think that's gonna be our next step. We're gonna plan something in July um, and hope that everyone can attend. Um, they've also said we should keep encouraging people to remain involved, keep the communication ongoing. So I normally send about a weekly email to the SAFOS group, um, just saying, you know, what our updates are, what our plans are. We've got our um, annual meeting coming up and we've been given a time slot again, which is awesome that we're being recognized, um, you know, that we're here to stay. So I've been giving them some updates on that. And some have also said that having some targets and goals uh, might improve the experience. So in conclusion, there's definitely a need for mentorship in South Africa. And we can see that even this early, almost informal contact has meant a lot to these um, young uh, surgeons. Um, and of course, when women support each other, incredible things happen. Thank you. So this is just, uh, I always have to brag about the city that I live in. And this is just one of my hikes, a photo that I took um, of Table Mountain in the background. Uh, so please, when COVID ends, please uh, come and visit um, South Africa and Cape Town because we truly live in an awesome country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie. Uh Dr. Tiar, could you tell me, um, you're a young program, you've done so much in such a short amount of time. How does that potentially uh, interact with the work you do in women and orthopedics worldwide? Do you try and cross-pollinate the two groups or are you thinking about that as a future goal? Uh, absolutely. So um, I am a member of Women in, um, in, um, women in Orthopedics Worldwide as well as IOTA. Um, and a lot of my EXCO members are as well. I think going forward, we're definitely going to try and collaborate as much as possible. Um, the Women in Orthopedics uh, Worldwide has got a Facebook group that a lot of my members are also um, privy to and, and have joined. Um, and I think going forward, definitely we want to collaborate. I think the problem in South Africa is we are quite a conservative nation um, and I can see that there's women are a little bit sort of um, afraid to to make you know ruffle feathers or raise their voices. So I think with time, as they see more and more women globally um, actively participating in improving diversity, I think that will slowly give them the confidence um, to participate. Thank you so much. Your trailblazing ways are so inspiring. We appreciate you being uh, here today. Thank you. We're going to move on. Uh, 
I want to introduce uh, Fergal Monzel. Mr. Monzel is a consultant pediatric orthopedic surgeon at the Royal Hospital for Children in Bristol, England. Mr. Monzel is a specialty editor for pediatrics in Bone and Joint Journal and has long been an advocate for mentorship and diversity uh, for medical students. Uh, Mr. Monzel is going to speak to us th today with a really wonderful uh, uh, titled uh, talk, It Ain't What You Don't Know That Gets You in Trouble. Uh, Mr. Monzel. Floor is yours, sir. You might be on mute. I shall never forgive myself. I'll start. <laughs> there we hear you wonderfully. I will Thank never you. forgive myself how that is. Uh, anyway, so that's a, a, a taste of things to come. I hope not. So I've titled this, It Ain't What You Don't Know That Gets You Into Trouble. And I will come back to that. But as is customary these days, I need to make my disclosures. And for this forum, my disclosures are as follows. I'm a Caucasian cisgender male. I'm heterosexual. I am privileged and I was born in 1960 and all of those factors have influenced the way I interact with the world and the people who inhabit it. My worldview is informed by post-colonial Britain and post-Cold War Eurocentrics and also a Judeo-Christian influence but not necessarily practice. So that's who I am. And so I might ask a very important question. What credentials do I have to address you on the subject of diversity? So it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so is the quote. And that's by Mark Twain. And what I think it means to me is that I, I, you need to question the things you hold dear and true constantly to be able to make a fair difference in a personal and professional environment such as orthopedics. And if you just believe blindly in everything that you've ever been told, that's when you're gonna get into trouble. And it's a problem of perception because not only do I have those personality traits and influences, the year of my birth, makes me a particular type of human. I'm a boomer. And now the people for whom I'm responsible professionally are from a different generation. And that's fine. It's we're different. We're not better. We're not worse. But if we don't understand and recognize the differences, there will be trouble for both sides of the equation. And for me, the difference the years make for me this is when I was training, and this is the age now of the majority of people who I'm responsible for. And this is me now. And the only constant in those two photos is the amount of hair. It just happens to have changed from one individual to the other. And a magic number, there'll be all sorts of uh, personal prejudices that are unevidenced but what I'll try and defend for you. A magic number, the age at which you become all the things that you previously mocked, in my view, is about 40. And so when I'm teaching medical students, residents, that's who I think I am, and that's who I hope they see. But the older I get, the more I know that they're actually, that's who they see. And I've got to recognise that, because you can't turn time back. And the things I think are important and the things they think are important may be different. We can agree to differ, but we mustn't, I mustn't impose what I think is correct onto people who I'm trying to encourage, not necessarily influence. And for me, a Damascene moment was I was sitting in a Saturday morning trauma meeting and I was surrounded by my junior team. They were working hard. They'd, they'd been bashed that night, but they were still working hard. And I looked around and I realized that I didn't know anyone's name in that room. 
and it struck me how did I become this person who I used to despise and it was at that point I thought I'm going to try and make the way I interact with my trainees my students slightly different I'm going to get to tr I'm going to try and get to know them there will be quotes from a number of people and when I put this together I realized all the quotes are from long dead white males and so what I wanted to share with you is if I had a top five people that influenced me and it's not just because it's diversity I wrote this list out a while ago my wife and my mother get free entry if I couldn't say that there would be something wrong with my life but people who have really influenced me from a scientific perspective Emmanuel, St Emmanuel Stodowska Curie and I used to be really interested in physics and she was, she's Marie Curie. Sophie Scholl is probably the bravest person that I have ever read about. And if you don't know her story, I would recommend that you look it up. And Malala Yousafzai, it's not what happened to her, which was terrible. It's what she did next that really impressed me. And they're people who I think, if they only could have said things that I could put into an orthopedic talk, I could replace all my statue people who you'll see now. And this is one, this is Edmund Burke. Edmund Burke was a, uh, an Enlightenment philosopher. Um, and this statue is five minutes from my office. And if you look at that building there, you'll understand why I'm showing you this. Because that is the same building. And this is the plinth, which some of you may have seen in the international news last year, was Edward Colston's statue, which they tore down in, um, uh, in a, a Black Lives Matter um, event. It should have been taken down months ago, but it's gone now. But Edmund Burke, I was thinking, oh my goodness, I hope they don't turn on Edmund Burke because he actually was probably okay. And he said, nobody made a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could only do a little. That was of his time to rid of the pronouns and to make it more modern. It says to me, that you use the influence you have to make frequent small changes. And if you think things are too hard or you're not prepared to make little differences, you miss a huge trick. And I've been massively influenced by this because I know I can't compete with the previous speakers with their influence, but I can influence what's at arm's length. And I can make small changes around those people who, who come to me for teaching and, and advice. And for me, it was about empowerment. It's how do I empower our students to make the changes that they need? So you ask them, what do they want? What do you want? What do you need? And what format do you want it? And I've learned huge amounts about things I otherwise wouldn't have discovered about what the contemporary student and young trainee's mind, how it works in a way different to mine. No better, no worse, just different. But if I try and teach them the way I was taught, it will fail. And we put together a whole bunch of things. We, we, every summer I, I take half a dozen students, we've taken 70 students over the last 10 years, and we produce things like this. They make them, I just open the doors for them. I provide them with the materials and then they make the teaching materials for their peers. And, and, and that's pretty successful. So we had groups making podcasts. They had questions that they wanted to ask of people. And I just basically, in, did the introductions and they did the rest and all these are available for you to listen to and I think they are absolutely superb and we had other groups who just made um, information booklets for the fa for the families of the children we treat and they were involved in the core business of the hospital uh, and they I think benefited from it because it's it, it showed them things that they otherwise wouldn't have seen and therefore I hope gave them choices that they otherwise wouldn't have considered. And so the mistake that you could make by doing these small things, I think useful things, is that actually things are pretty okay. You know, they're equitable, uh, you know, everything's going in the right direction. Things aren't the same as they were in the 50s. They're a bit better now. It's just a matter of time. And I hear these things rehearsed frequently and I just, I'm afraid I can't agree with them. And yeah, move along, there's nothing to see here. And I think then you don't discharge your responsibilities because the questions you're asking are just a little bit too hard. If you look at our system about what equality and diversity means in our undergraduate population, and the reason that I am concentrating on the undergraduates is because in the blink of an eye, these are the people who will be considering 
orthopedic surgery as a career. And the great majority of them won't even think of it. So in our system, there is, there's been gender parity, in fact, more female than male medical students for the last 20 years. And that's a professional generation. The people who were in medical school at the left-hand side of this slide are now consultants, if that's what they, the path they chose. To make it easier for you, it's, uh, you know, it's 60, 40, thereabouts, um, but the actual hardcore, uh, sorry, 60, 40. But if you look at how orthopedics looks in the UK, and this is based on 2020 data, about 7% of orthopedic consultants in our system are female. And so these are the figures and you can make of them what you will. There is a caveat that diversity is not just about gender equality, but it is just more easy to illustrate. And you can use the same arguments, I think, to consider whichever demographic is under discussion. And so this is the prospectus from the University of Bristol. This is the, 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 the these are the faces of the, the undergrads who will get 2021. And so there must be a massive difference on their day one, year one of medical school and the day they choose their specialist training because so many don't choose orthopedics because of reasons which are opaque. So you have to accept that orthopedics isn't for everyone. It's not, it's just facile to think, well, everyone will want to do it. And so if you don't do it, there must be an exclusion. Of course, it's not for everyone, but I just fail to accept that it's explainable just on uh, um, 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 demographics. Is it explainable on the basis of exclusion? And if it's exclusion, is that deliberate or subliminal? And I think that probably subliminally, people like me discourage undergraduate medical students at a very early stage from even considering it. I'll just give you some examples. The culture of orthopedics. I'm a prototype orthopedic surgeon in our system for me. That's how other people see us. You know, it's just, you know, top of the tree uh, with people coming, you know, at your feet. It's a really good parody slide. But that's what people think of us. Stupidity is a more dangerous enemy of the good than malice, and that's Dietrich von Hofer. And I think that's right. We're pretty stupid because we don't actively challenge the stereotypes. We don't actively try and give a better account of ourselves in a professional environment, in the majority. So what's putting them off? So let's think about our two neophyte medical students turning up on day one, not having any preconceived ideas about what they want to do. And they go to the trauma meeting. And so there's the trauma meeting. That's pretty much what it looks like. And the core trainee is asked to present a history. And they're not fluent because they're nervous. It's a big, scary place and they stutter a little bit and they can't recite the current labs and the patient isn't consented. And all of a sudden, the lead person turns into the antichrist. And that's pretty, I think, you know, you will probably recognize that as an extreme. No, it's not an extreme, it's a parody, but it's a common example. And we did a lot of work, we, the Royal We, our system did a lot of work about bullying and harassment. And if you look at definitions, bullying is abuse or misuse of power through means intended to undermine, humiliate, injure, oops, or injure. And that demonstration for me, is a prime example of what we are not supposed to be doing anymore. And our students will watch it. And I don't blame them for thinking, actually, I don't want to play. I don't want to go here. This is not the sort of thing I really wanted to choose as a career. And very early on, I fear we're putting people off for fairly simple reasons. And then you get the next patient who's an IVDU, never called anything. They're, they're labeled by this four letter acronym approximately 25, and then everyone turns into, dun, 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 yeah, no one wants to know, they turn into, you know, automatons, because that's something that doesn't interest them. And the presentation goes on, left the ward, probably to score, 
for an IND sometime on the end of someone's list, I expect. And I get very cross when I hear this because again, bullying and harassment is characterized as behavior that is offensive, intimidating, malicious. And I think that is what that type of presentation, uh, it, it can be defined as. And so my medical students sitting there have already been lost. They're not gonna come to a group of people that behave in this way. But if you ask the perpetrators in inverted commas, I think, well, it's just banter, it's just stuff. Well, that may be, but it's pernicious and it's putting a lot of people off and it's insulting. And so that's our trauma meeting this morning. I took the picture this morning and everything's going on. And from the back of the room, Adiem's going, well, you know, I'm not been included here. It's a bit of a setup and she knows she's going to be on this. But see, and that's what I see is the medical students and juniors are at the back of the room. They're not included. They're put off immediately. I'm very disappointed with this woman because whatever I've said to her, she's definitely going to be a paediatric surgeon and not an orthopedic surgeon. And I'm bitterly disappointed, but there's nothing we can do. She's a great loss to our, to, 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 to our, to our service. She'd be a great gain to the paediatric um, surgery mob. So the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who maintain their neutrality in a period of moral crisis. That's, um, Dante's infer that's the Inferno. And I love the quote. And what does it really mean? It means that you can't just look away. If, you, if, you're, un if you're uncomfortable about it as I am and you don't do something about it, then you, know, you take what's coming to you. And so how can I change the culture of a trauma meeting? It's just a metric of... of trying to invoke change in a small way at a very downstream level that if adopted widely and more expansively may make a little bit of a difference. So you have a trauma meeting which is informative, collaborative, friendly and fun. Now I can't do that at the, the wave of magic wand but what we have done during COVID is we've tried to do just that by making it virtual. So we just made the virtual trauma meeting for medical students. So all the nonsense that I've just described to you goes all the latin words and the the arcane classifications that we hide behind goes and the people who present in these meetings i want to be able to give a common sense account of orthopedic conditions for undergraduates and we've done 10 of them we had them bi-weekly in the evening because that's when the students wanted them we did them at the back end of last year zoom for me is nothing new covid has made it legitimate but it's something i've, I've been using teleconferencing for a while and for me this is absolutely it's open doors because now everyone is familiar with it it was widely advertised on facebook i don't do facebook but the students did all the advertising uh, you can't be what you can't see so deliberately we not deliberately rightly but deliberately had a diverse faculty and it doesn't matter who the faculty is, provided it's not me, because I do not want that stereotype to be the first thing the students see. And these are very short clips because I don't want to run too far over. And these are, they're available, and it's a medical student who introduces. Welcome to the virtual trauma meeting. The aim is to provide a friendly environment for open case-based discussions with the help of orthopedic trainees and consultants to build upon orthopedic knowledge and experience for undergraduates. Please. And so, so again, I want to do your exam on her hand, thumbs up, which is testing thumb extension, which is the radial nerve. And at the end, encouraging engagement and questions. We hope this has been informative. If you have any questions or suggestions for further programmes, please contact us at the Grand Academy at btinternet.com. And so, the series one, we did a whole bunch of things. We asked them what they wanted to hear about. We made the programs and we put them on you. We edited them down and put them on YouTube so they could be a resource for our undergrads. And that's now something we're going to roll out in series two. And we're going to try and do it in multi centers in the UK. See so if we can get a bit of inertia behind this as a project. Um, they, they had formal certification. It was good for their portfolios. And I think everyone got something out of it. So what can I do? Well, I recognize I can only take small steps. But I think early engagement is extremely important. Encouragement is so undervalued, uh, it, it, but, but, but so important. You have to kill the stereotype. You know, what I'm trying to do is put people like me out of business. I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's just the way it has to be. Other people who don't look like me have to fill these spaces. Otherwise, we've made no progress. And you have to demonstrate alternatives. Otherwise, there's no purpose to any of this. But what have I really learned over the last 35 years? That was me as a trainee, and that's me as just as a 
nearly retired orthopedic surgeon. What I've really learned is as follows. All you've got to do is be on time, be nice, be optimistic, and then just let it play. Thank you for your attention. Fantastic, Virgil. Amazing. You uh, really... Uh... You really encourage me to kind of say what I mean and say what I think in talks. So I think you uh, captured the spirit and essence of uh, bringing out what was in your heart. And I think you've, uh, you've modeled that. Uh, how are you seeing others around you accept this way? And, and are you affecting change amongst those who you would potentially traditionally believe uh, uh, do not want to think in this way? Um, I, I am very encouraged by the buy-in from people like me and it's just we don't know how to do it and this is just a small idea but it's given us a, a hook that we can actually use no, no one's comfortable about how things are there are some you know some people you won't change you've just got to make sure that, that their influence is managed but quite a lot of people actually you know I'd say this you know, an awful lot of my contemporaries are very liberal minded people. We all have our prejudices. We carry them. You know, that's who we are. But 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 they can see through that and understand that the status quo is not as good as we can get it by any many means. So they want a way that they can that they can influence it. And this actually the, the advantage of this is because it's really simple and it's actually quite a lot of fun. And everyone comes out of it feeling a little bit better. So you don't have to sell it very hard. And what I want to do as well is I want to extend this to, you know, my other thing is, is, is we, I was in uh, the, the OR this morning and, and we have a medical student who was there who was terrified because no one had told her, actually, you know, if you breathe out too hard, the, you know, it's not going to affect the operation. If you move, you know, you get to get people to relax and get them included. It's so easy. And these are easy. They're low hanging fruits. They're easy wins. But if we don't do it, I think everyone's concentrating on the, 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 the people who have already made their mind up to, to, to become orthopedic surgeons. My group that I'm most interested in are the people who never would consider it, but may make the best orthopedic surgeons in the world. So in answer to your question, there is buy-in because it's easy. That's wonderful. On a tactical note, are, are the videos available to anybody on, yeah. uh, on YouTube or is it a sign up with a password? Okay. No, I'm, I'm an information communist, and they go straight onto YouTube. They're free to view. Trouble is, you've got to edit a few. I put them out, and I had some some very very pedantic, deliberately pedantic reviewers, and there's a few mistakes. So you have to give us about a week, but then they'll be available on YouTube, free to view. Anyone can have them, and we'll give you grace as well. Huh? <laughs> we'll give you good grace. Too. In about a week, uh, but but again, for, for me, if it's 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 got to be easy. It's got it's got to be accessible. It's got to be free, um, and you know it's only a oh, cracky. There's just uh, yeah, a bunch of YouTube talks here. It's not going to change the world. It's just, Thank you, know, you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, the other panelists are on. We have about nine minutes left. Are there any questions between the panelists? Anything inspired you to ask a question? We don't have any questions in the chat and. I uh, just wanted to give the, any of the panelists an opportunity to extemporaneously speak or have a question. Just want to make a comment. I think Fer Fergal's uh, presentation was perfect. Fergal, it, 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 it brings me joy that your trauma room is not also filled. Not, it's good to have history, but also trauma rooms that are intimidating with a lot of like, paintings of a man that, that achieved a lot of things in the, with hands like this <laughs> just kidding but it's just uh, it's very it, it was very inspiring talk thank you very much my role in the trauma meeting is a bodyguard for the young folk <laughs> <laughs> that's my role now at least i know what it is <laughs> that's right any other thoughts or comments or questions Dr. Samora, any any uh, closing thoughts then from you? Yeah, no, I think um, clearly we have some of the leaders across the globe with us today. And um, I, I love Dr. Monsell's thought that it doesn't matter 
how big a change you can make in your small sphere, you can make a huge change. And I think that is the best take home message of the day. And that, yes, we might not all have the influence that everyone on the panel has, but certainly in our own spheres, we can have quite a profound influence on those around us. And really just promoting this concept of inclusivity and diversity will make us a better specialty. So thank you all for what you do and for being here. I want to thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Samora, for helping me to navigate through the multiple time zones and planning of this. Uh, you're, you're, we're, we're, I think we make a great team. And I do want to uh, give one more shout out to uh, uh, all of our panelists, Dr. Dematos, Dr. Tiart, Dr. Foon, and Mr. Monzel. Thank you all for the amazing session. Uh, this is uh, going to go down in posterity for all to uh, view again, and uh, we'll view again and again. Thank you again. I'm going to say uh, good morning, good night, good afternoon, depending upon where you are. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody.